and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Monday, January 30th, we are studying John chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. Jesus goes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, where a large crowd follows him. How will this big crowd eat? Well, what follows is one of the most beloved of Jesus' signs, the feeding of the 5,000. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Andrew Belt. Pastor Belt serves at Christ Lutheran Church in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Pastor Belt, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Well, thanks for having me on today. As we get started today, Pastor, let's talk a little context. We're starting John chapter 6 today. What should we know about the Gospel of John as a whole and anything leading up to this text that will help us dig into these verses? Well, I always love with John's writings in particular, right? Whether it's Gospel, the three epistle letters that he writes, or his book of Revelation, is that he always kind of builds on the discussion, right? It's kind of hard to open up John in the middle of any of his arguments because he said stuff beforehand that you got to keep in mind as he then brings it up again, but then he kind of like, well, uh, kind of a pun here, fleshes it out more. <laughs> and then, you know, as he kind of keeps going on and I always, I always remember my teachers would talk about it, it's like, John is a, a spiral staircase. And the further up you go, right, it, it, it come back to like the same words and phrases and that kind of will help you refer back and also forward. So John, you know, we talk about scripture interprets scripture. Well, John loves to interpret himself as he goes along. So I, I kind of like that, you know, where chapter one is, you know, the prologue. And it really is like the primer and it sets the stage where the rest of the chapters start filling in what exactly it means when we talk about Jesus as the word of God. And, and how does that play out in the gospel? And uh, that, that's what I think I love the most, too, about John's writings. So you you mentioned that John often will circle back around to themes that he's brought up before. I think you especially see that in his epistles and in the book of Revelation as well. In the gospel, it may be a little bit harder to detect because he is writing narratives, right. but I, I think you see that evidence of that structure that you're talking about. So what are some of those themes and concepts that John has brought up in the past and, and coming forward into the future in this gospel that we're going to encounter in this part of chapter six? Yeah. So, you know, when we get to chapter one, you know, the chapter one will always hit with the major themes. So you get the, the word of God. Jesus is the word of God that was in the beginning. Uh, you get the idea of, you know, being sent. You know, the father has sent forth his son. John the Baptist is sent. Uh, Jesus later on at the end of the gospel is going to send out his disciples. Um, you'll also check out and you can see the themes of light and darkness in John's gospel, right? He is the light that darkness has not overcome. And you'll see that play out in the gospel, especially when we get to the Jesus walking on water here in this text as, uh, you know, it's the nighttime. And so when you get like these little uh, cues in John's gospel, where it's nighttime or it's daytime. In chapter three, we're told that Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, which is both one, the time that he came to Jesus, and as the reader accuse us into the darkness of the human condition that Jesus has come into to bring the light into the world. Um, so some of those things will be really apparent, uh, the seeing and hearing, belief, unbelief, you know, why are these crowds in chapter six, you know, as we, we'll meet them today. And as you go forward in the rest of the chapter, how are they going to hear and receive Jesus? Um, and, and so th those themes go all over in John's gospel and, and spades. Uh, so that, I think that's some of the key parts that we're going to get here today in particular. The text that we have today, at least the first 15 verses, deal with what's commonly called the feeding of the 5,000. And we know from the other evangelists that there were more than 5,000 people there. John himself will tell us that there were about 5,000 men. So we know there were more, but it's usually called the feeding of the 5,000. And if, if my memory is correct, this is the only of Jesus' miracles that's recorded in all four of the Gospels, other than 
what happens during Holy Week, the death and resurrection of our Lord. So this is a pretty common text that we're going to hear. We're also going to look at the walking on water, which I think is another fairly common one. Just thinking about texts that we, quote, know well, how do how should we approach them so that we don't just kind of breeze over them? Like, yeah, I know that. Let's just keep moving. How do we approach those mm. common texts in helpful ways as Christians? You know, I, I always think the big key thing, like you said, it's easy to brush by them. Uh, I've always come to find for myself when it's a text that's familiar, if I'm preaching it, you know, if this text were to come up and I have to preach it, I sit there and I'm like, oh, I know this account really well. Uh, maybe we'll stop and try to, well, I'll read it several times. And when, if I think I know it really well, I go back to it and just kind of slow. So you read a verse, pause on it, reflect, pray, read the next, you know, so it's just kind of where I, I'm forcing myself to slow down because it's usually when I do that, then when things start lighting up um, or if, you know, beforehand, if it's a familiar text like John six, I might read John up, you know, starting at chapter one, getting up to chapter six, where I'll pick up those themes and those, you know, Q words from John. And all of a sudden I'll see that. In fact, when I was preparing for this, right, like, oh, this is a very common story. <laughs> That's actually what I did was just kind of read it ahead. And then as I got to chapter six, I'm like, oh, there's that. Oh, yep. I remember John talking about that. And it all of a sudden brings a flavor back out into the text that maybe I missed, you know, kind of like when you're eating meat or if you're having like wine, right, you got to slowly swish it around. And uh, you'll start picking up the hints and the flavors that make it much more rich. Yeah. So we have the opportunity to do that today with John chapter six. We're reading verses one to 21. Again, two real uh, two accounts here that we're going to look at. I'm going to start with, again, the so-called feeding of the 5,000. I'll read verses one to 15 to get us started. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about five thousand in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is coming into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And I'll pause there. That takes us through verse 15 of John chapter 6. So, Pastor Belt, the text starts after this, Jesus <laughs> went away. So, talk about that after this. Remind us of what was happening in chapter 5 and connect that to what happens here in chapter 6. Yeah, so as we remember from chapter 5, this was the healing at the pool uh, when you know Jesus healed the man and it, it stirs up a bunch of controversy, right? The the Pharisees, the leaders, they get into the discussion with Jesus and the crowds. And Jesus kind of, you know, he makes himself equal with God is what, you know, John, as John writes it there. And the, that gets Jesus into one of the, uh, another discourse, right? A, a speech about who he is, that, you know, he's reflecting the father um, and that he's doing what the father does. And then at the end of it all, right, he, he starts talking to him about how the people are missing him. Um, and they look and he ends right before our chapter today. Um, he talks about Moses and, you know, reflecting back on that and that Moses is actually writing about him, Jesus. And he's like, you know, if you believe Moses, you would believe me for he wrote of me. Uh, but if you do not believe his wor- his writings, how you believe my words. And that, that really sets the stage for this chapter and the crowds when Jesus once again starts talking and you know, later on, they're going to have a hard time receiving him and he'll tell them, right, uh, 
his words are spirit and life, but you know, they're of the flesh. And so there's a disconnect. And you know, in John's gospel, uh, this disconnect is happening to everyone, even the Jesus' own disciples. And the problem becomes is that they lack the spirit. And you know, John 7 is going to get there where you know the spirit has not yet been given because Jesus has not yet been glorified, which is the cross and the empty tomb. And and after that, that's when it's going to make sense. Um, yeah, so that's why Jesus will tell them, right? Right now, you know, this isn't clicking with you guys, but you know, hold on, it one day will. The spirit will come. Uh, so they're just here to, to watch and see this, and we're going to have that with Peter's brilliant and beautiful confession at the end of this chapter, right? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So that, you know, that kind of leads us up back into chapter six um, as we see Jesus and sets the stage for the, the, pair, uh, the, for the feeding of the 5,000 and his teaching here. So as we read chapter six, we want to keep in mind what Moses wrote and how that connects to what Jesus is saying and how if, you've, if you're listening to Moses and believing what he says, then that should lead you to believe what Jesus says. That's going to become a lot more apparent as we move forward in this chapter. Our text for today is primarily what Jesus does, but the rest of the chapter really is going to be about what Jesus says. And so we want to keep that context in mind, not only for what happens in this text today, but going forward into to chapter six farther as Jesus makes this into an opportunity for an extended sermon, an extended discourse to teach more about who he is. So that's our context. Jesus is by the Sea of Galilee. He's on the other side. That Going back and forth on the Sea of Galilee is going to come up again later in our text. And there's this large crowd who's with him. Talk about why the crowd is there and why that's significant. Yeah, the crowd is there. We're told in, in verse 2, they, they're following him because the signs, they saw them, the signs that he is doing on the sick, sick probably you know, at the quick near context being John chapter five. Uh, but, you know, they're, I'm sure they're amazed. And from the other gospels, we know that Jesus is, is healing all over the place. And so it, this is drawing an audience. And in John's gospel in particular, if we remember back in chapter four, the healing of the, the servant's son there, um, mm-hmm. there was the, the context when the, the officer comes up to him and he says, Lord, you know, my, uh, my servant is sick. And Jesus looks at him and says, if, unless you guys see signs and wonders, you'll never believe. And, you know, he's not saying that as, a, oh, well, let's do signs, and you'll believe. He's kind of saying that as almost a critique. You know, mm-hmm. th- these people are never going to come to faith because they just see something. Uh, John's gospel is always about hearing the word and, and believing it and, and hearing the words of Jesus in particular uh, and coming into eternal life to hear the words of the Son of God. As, you know, we heard back in chapter five, the dead will be raised. Um, but here, right, it, it sets up maybe uh, the tone for the upcoming confusion and rejection of the crowds, right? They see the signs and, w- well, how are they going to take that? How are they going to hear and receive Jesus, though, when he starts talking and speaking? Um, and there's going to be that disconnect that we hear. So John always has a, a bit of um, seeing isn't believing, right? It's always hearing the word, which we know, right? Uh, Faith comes by hearing, as Paul will say in Romans 10. Um, But just kind of, you know, it sets that stage. And of course, at the end of the gospel, we see that, you know, connecting with John 10, where Jesus calls his sheep. Well, after the resurrection, what does Jesus do? He he says, Mary, and she recognizes him, right? So even though she saw him, she didn't recognize him until she heard the word, in fact, her name. Uh, So here, right, we see this, uh, you know, wrestling with seeing and hearing and belief and unbelief. Uh, so that I think that's kind of an important connection to make here too with the crowds and, and coming up because it sets that stage for Jesus' miracle, uh, talking about, you know, how with Moses, right? If we were saying, oh, Moses wrote of Christ, well, then that also is making us think, okay, well, what Jesus is about to do next should help us look back on the life of God's people, especially in the days of Moses. And we should see that. And, and we do here in these early verses of chapter six. So take us into these, these coming verses then. And with what we've already said, draw some of those connections between what we see here in the life of Christ and what Moses wrote and what Moses did. Yeah. So you reflect back on the old Testament story, right? God brought his people out of Egypt and, and gave them the land that he promised to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as we reflect on some of those key moments, right? The people of Israel, they, they crossed the Red Sea, 
Um, they were fed in the wilderness from the manna from heaven. All right. They, they journeyed to Mount Sinai where they sealed the covenants, right? The Ten Commandments and, and all that. And then were sent out. And we have a lot of teaching, right? So you can think back on the life of Moses where you get like the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy that are full of the teachings and the instructions of the Torah, right? Of God. And so those are like key moments in the life of Israel's history that are near and dear to them. And in John chapter six, we, we see these th- same things coming out as well in the life of Jesus. So right off the bat, Jesus crosses the sea of Galilee, right? So he crosses the sea to go to the other side. Um, this, uh, here we get the, the feeding of the 5,000 and right. Any, um, any of the Jews watching Jesus and participating in this miracle or the miraculous feeding right away, they're thinking, the manna that came down from above in the wilderness, that just happened again. Of course, they're, they think better than they know because we know this, this isn't just a repeat of the past. This is Jesus fulfilling Moses, right? Uh, Moses, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus, you know, he's up on the mountain with them um, and he has them sit down, right? This, this is a, the the time for teachings. And we know from the other gospels that Jesus taught before the miracle. Um, you know, so there's all this, there's the, the mountain, Mount Sinai, we get the feeding, the wilderness feedings. Uh, so all of this is just connecting. So as we're reading John chapter six, wondering, okay, Moses wrote of Jesus. And we're right when that question's on our mind, we start seeing it in the text all the way through. Uh, and I think that's just a, a beautiful reflection on it as well. Talk more about the detail that John gives us in verse four, that the fact that the Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand. We were talking earlier about, you know, how to read a text like this. That's very common. We know it well at this, as I was doing my prep work for this, this detail really stood out to me that the Passover was at hand. I don't recall that being written for us by either Matthew, Mark or Luke, but he, seeing it here in John kind of stuck out to me. Wait a second. The feeding of the 5,000 is being connected with the Passover. That seems pretty significant. Yeah. I think that's one of those, you know, we talked about those hints and flavors in the text that this is a familiar text. But when you read that line and you compare it to, you know, the synoptic gospels in particular, you're like, oh, that detail is not there. Why is that? Because no word is wasted in the scriptures. Uh, you know, all of it has, is there for detail, for enlightenment and for, you know, pointing us to Christ. and from what we know for the Passover, right? Jesus, who is our Passover lamb, who will give his life uh, for the life of the world, um, who will give his flesh for the life of the world, that really is also going to connect as we read the discourse that Jesus and the crowds have um, on this miracle and on Jesus talking about giving his his flesh for the life of the world. Uh, Passover, we would remember the, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, which brings us also back to chapter one, when John the Baptist pointed at Jesus a couple of times and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, so all of this is just working in, in concert and harmony. Uh, and it's a, very, a small detail we might think, but if we stop and, and ponder on the text as a whole, I think that just really gives it a lot of weight too. Hmm. The last time the Passover was mentioned in the Gospel of John, unless I'm forgetting one, was back in chapter two, where Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the Passover. And there in John two, John recorded for us the, what's often called the cleansing of the temple. And as a part of the aftermath of that, you know, they ask him for a sign Uh and Jesus says, you destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. And, And John tells us they all realized later he was talking about the temple of his body, his own death and resurrection. Now in, in this text though, with the Passover being noted, he's, in Galilee, near the Sea of Galilee, instead of Jerusalem. And just, I, I don't know, in, in my mind, as I'm connecting those two mentions of the Passover, one there in Jerusalem, where he talks about how you know, he is the true temple. Now here the Passover shows up, and he's not actually in the temple, but he's doing something that, that's going to connect his own death and resurrection. I don't know, I, I just wonder if, if we can connect those two texts in some way like yeah. that. Yeah, oh, I, you know, that is something I, I, I didn't even think about. So that, that just kind of, opens up a whole new uh, box for me to kind of sit and chew on as well. Um, you know, and as I kind of was hearing you talk and, and thinking about that as well, uh, something that stuck out to me uh, with that thought is just how 
you know, there's, I think there's one more Passover account in John's gospel, if I remember correctly too, which will be the one leading up to his death. Um, I think you're right. And, and so I, as we kind of see these, right, these three events kind of working in concert, um, it, what parallels should we probably see as we go through that text was, you know, Jesus is on the cross or should we be having the cleansing of the temple in mind? Should we be having the giving his, uh, light, uh, flesh for the life of the world in mind. I think we should. Uh, so that's, I think, another great way that John is subtly self-referencing um, himself here and you know, using the greater biblical narrative to do so. Hmm. Yeah. So, so to connect the feeding of the 5,000 with the Passover, that is something that John the evangelist invites us to do very specifically that maybe, you know, again, where each of the other evangelists has certain emphases that they want to get across. Here's one of John's a good reason to pay attention to these texts that we know well, to see what it is that, that the text is bringing to us, that the Holy spirit would have us learn from his word. So this is at the Passover when Jesus is doing this, he's on the mountain and, and then he lifts up his eyes and he sees the large crowd before Jesus says anything. That's the action that John records. What's the significance of the way John talks about what Jesus does there in verse five? Yeah. And, and this brings us back to chapter four. And if you remember chapter four, it's the, the woman at the well, the woman of Samaria. And in that chapter, which might be another important connection, because if we remember back in chapter four, Jesus tells her that neither on this mountain nor in the mountain of Jerusalem, right, will you worship God, but it will be done in spirit and truth. So I wonder if Jesus being away from Jerusalem at, at near so close to the Passover, I wonder if that kind of has any way. I don't know. That's something to kind of uh, think about and chew on some more. But here in this setting, this does bring us back to chapter four, because back then, and in that chapter, you know, the woman of Samaria, she goes away into town and she starts telling everyone about Jesus. Another of John's theme of witnessing. She starts witnessing and the crowds, after they hear her, they go out to see Jesus. And, and while they're walking out, we have Jesus with his disciples in that moment. And Jesus is talking about, you know, they brought back lunch, but Jesus says, I have food that, you know, you know nothing about. And the disciples are like, well, did someone, you know, give him something to eat? You know, they're, they're lost in translation as well. And at this point, this is when Jesus starts talking to them about his food is the, the will of God, what God the Father has sent him to do. And he tells them that they're about to enter into his work, the work of someone else, his disciples will enter into, which, you know, we have done that as well in our generation, right? We, we're following on the footsteps of those who have come before us. And here, Jesus, at that point, uses the same words and lifting up, lift up your eyes and look. And, and as they do, who's coming out to see them? The harvest, it's the Samaritans. And they're coming out to hear Jesus. And at the end of chapter four, right, we get kind of a similar, they hear Jesus and like, well, it's not because you told us that we believe, but we have heard and, and seen for ourselves. And, and, and we believe that this is the savior of the world, which is a similar confession that what we get here later on after the people see the sign and what was done, they say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. So there's, there's uh, confessions that are made after Jesus says something, does something. We'll have it again here in chapter six when Peter confesses, you know, you're, you know who shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Um, so that's kind of an important connection to make too. This is a, a, a harvest season. This is uh, Jesus has come to collect his own uh, kind of a, a word. But putting that phrase in the context of John 4 with the idea of the harvest that Jesus brings up, I think is is helpful, uh, particularly in light of what you were saying earlier about verse 2, that the crowd is here because they've seen the signs that he was doing on the sick. And so you know, in John's gospel, that's a an indication that they're maybe not there for the right reasons, mm-hmm. at least not just yet. But still, when Jesus looks on them, he sees this as a harvest field. I, I, I've seen this same gentleness of our Lord or long suffering nature of our Lord. Perhaps that's the way to think about his patience in connection with say Nathaniel in chapter one, you know, who Nathaniel thought what good can come out of Nazareth and Jesus still revealed himself to him. And you mentioned Nicodemus before in chapter three and Jesus, he certainly says, are you a teacher of Israel? And, and you don't know these things, but he still, you know, he teaches them here too with a crowd that's coming out because they've seen the signs and maybe it's easy to write them off oh you're you're just here for the wrong reasons why should i bother 
And Jesus doesn't have that attitude with them. He he still sees them as as the harvest, and he's ready to to preach the word to them truly. Yeah, he right. Go back to John chapter three, right? God so loved the world, he sent his only son. Uh, we, we have this where God loves his world, even the fallen world in darkness, and Jesus comes to be the light to reveal it, right? It's tragic that those who love the darkness and, and, and flee from him, but yet Jesus comes to give his light and love even to them, right? For the whole world, um, even those who would crucify him, right? That long suffering. And we see that with Thomas, right? Jesus comes and reveals himself to Thomas at the end of the gospel. Peter, right? He, he works with him after denying him three times at the very end, looks at him and, and restores him. Peter, do you love me? All right? Feed my sheep. Uh, so we, we do see that. I, I think that gives a, a huge, you know, direction of who our Lord and his attitude and his love for the creation that we also likewise share in who, you know, in a world that's full of darkness and violence and hatred and, and even spurning God and his word, it doesn't call us to respond in kind, but yet hearing Paul in Romans 12, right? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. To see the love that God and through his son has for the world that we too then take up and mimic with our lives and our actions as well. So Jesus lifts up his eyes. He sees the harvest coming yet again. He prepares to give this people his good gifts. And we're going to see how Jesus does that on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking about John chapter six with Pastor Andrew Belt. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Monday, January 30th. We are studying John chapter 6, verses 1 to 21 with Pastor Andrew Belt. He serves at Christ Lutheran Church in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Pastor Belt, prior to the break, we left off where Jesus lifts up his eyes. He sees the harvest coming to him, just like he saw in John chapter 4. It's this large crowd. And so Jesus initiates a conversation with Philip in particular. He says, where are we to buy bread? so that these people may eat. John, the evangelist, tells us this is Jesus testing him because he already knows what he's going to do. Philip's got a response. Take us into this initial interaction between Jesus and Philip. Yeah, it, you know the crowds are coming out, and then you can picture the thousands here. Jesus lays out a question to Philip, and Philip has to, I'm sure he's kind of flabbergasted. right? He's, he's looking at the crowds. He's counting on his fingers. He's, he's guessing, estimating, well, you know, 200 denarii, right? that maybe would start covering a little bit for these people. And it, what, you know, Jesus, we're told he says is because he wants to, to test him because uh, he already knows what he's going to do, but he, he wants Peter, uh, the Philip to remember this. And this is a call back, right? Going back to chapter four, when the Samaritan woman is gone and outside and talking to the Samaritans in town, the disciples are with Jesus. And Jesus, right, they brought lunch, but Jesus tells them, no, I, I already have food that you know nothing about. And, you know, as they remember this, this is to do the will of God. So kind of a flash forward here, if, you know, Philip is remembering this conversation, right, he would remember that Jesus has a food that no one, you know, no one knows where it comes from. And, uh, you know, this is kind of laying it back and Jesus is going to do this. He's going to provide food, right, that who knows where you know this is coming from, right? Jesus starts multiplying the loaves and starts keeps on handing it out. Um, that's going to lead into the discussion of you know Jesus is going to be also giving of his life uh, for the life of the world. Uh, so you know it's kind of a reminder for Philip, but you know also for us here too to 
called back to earlier chapters with Jesus talking to his disciples and teaching them uh, for an opportunity as well. I love the connection you made to chapter four and Jesus talking about the food that he has so that you see the the test here isn't just like, oh, Philip, do you believe in me? But do you remember what I taught you already? You know, Do you remember what I said about what my food is and this food that I, I have to give? So it, it, it calls back to that teaching of Jesus. I really like that connection. And and God bless Philip. You know, I mean, <laughs> I don't think I would have done much better than he did. No, me neither. 200 denarii. I, that's, and from, from what I understand, a, a denarius is one day's wage. So 200, we're talking over, over half a year's salary at this point that he's thinking about, and maybe that's enough. But again, I don't know that I would have done any better. Bless his heart, as, as we like to say. Right. That's not the end of the account, though. So we've talked about Philip. In verse 8, we meet Andrew, Simon Peter's brother again. He's come up in John's gospel before. He's maybe sometimes a little bit hidden in the shadow of his brother Peter, but he he stands out a couple times in John's gospel. What do we see from Andrew here in, in this part of John? Yeah, you know, we called chapter 1 when Andrew first is mentioned, and it's always with John the Baptist and hearing, you know, this is the Lamb of God. And then we're told that, you know, Andrew goes, gets his brother, Peter, and, and brings him. And so Andrew is in the gospel, always bringing people to Jesus. And we're going to see that later on as well. Um, but here we get this, uh, you know, G- here's Andrew. He comes and he's like, hey, I found this, uh, this child, this boy, and he's got a, you know, a little something. You know, so he kind of maybe comes to Philip's rescue here as he's kind of sweating bullets. And uh, he's like, well, I got this guy over here. Um, but, you know, we see when the disciples bring people, bring someone to Jesus, that Jesus is able to care. He's able to give an answer. He's able to provide. Um, and so, you know, we think of our mission as a church, we who have gone out to collect and, you know, fisher, fisher of men, uh, that when we bring them to Jesus, he's able to do something with them. He's able to show his love and his mercy, uh, his outpouring of grace uh, in, in ways that are unlooked for and maybe unseen. Uh, but that what Jesus can do, and and that and Andrew, we connect that in his go- in this gospel uh, every time that he appears, because people in John's gospel always come with ideas and themes with them too, and so John will kind of tie them to that, um, which is which is fun to, to read as well. All right, so Andrew again is bringing someone to Jesus this time the the boy who's got the food, but even he says, "What are they for yeah. so many?" So you know, he he still has the same concerns questions as philip does yeah and you know it almost kind of they're almost kind of waiting for jesus maybe to step in right they they don't got the answer right they don't have all the resources and we can think about maybe that for ourselves at the church too right we're not the ones who have all the answers we don't have you know we might be able to have a little bit of this or that but we need to look to our lord and this is a, a good teachable moment for jesus with his disciples that as they go out they're, they're going to be bringing people to Jesus, not to various uh, projects or uh, things at the church, right? But they're bringing them to Jesus. And I don't know, I, I have this in a lot of pulpits. I've seen it. It's in my pulpit here at my congregation. But when I step up, right, sir, we wish to see Jesus, which comes from John's gospel later on when the Gentiles come to Andrew, right? And they we want to see the Lord. Um, and I think that's a good cue for us that, you know, our means are limited. But we should go to our God who is gracious, who is merciful, who through his son Jesus has given us all things. Uh, yeah, I think mm-hmm. that's a good tie-in as well. So Jesus then, he he takes that opportunity in verse 10. He says, have the people sit down. And then there's another detail that's given. There was much grass in the place. Mm. I, I think it's Mark that mentions green grass also. Yeah. But John, John tells us about grass. And again, that seems like a pretty significant detail. So talk about how Jesus begins this sign that he's about to do. Yes. You know, th- one of the key ideas and speeches of Jesus, you know, and later on in chapter 10 is that I'm the good shepherd. And it, this is a, a direct allusion, right? We're, we're right to look back on Psalm 23, a, a very favored and beloved psalm. And to remember the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? He leads his flock into the green pastures um, and gives them the rest, right? Goodness and mercy overflow. Um, here we see this, my cup runneth over. Well, literally here in our text, right? The, the baskets are overflowing. The, you know, Jesus is able to supply. So the idea of green grass, right? If you do, uh, if this is a hyperlink, right? You click on the, the grass section here, 
and it would probably bring up Psalm 23. Uh, and you'd read that and just get another insight. And you can also remember John 10 with the, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, my sheep know me. Uh, and so beautiful allusions and references in this, just that one little word that can take it to so many places in the scriptures. Hmm. So Jesus then actually, well, John tells us first that there are about 5,000 men who sit down. Again, we, we know that from the other gospels as well. And then Jesus does the sign. He does the miracle. Talk about the way that John describes it here and what we should learn about Jesus from this. Mm. So yeah, in verse 11, right, he, he, it, it reminds us once again of the Exodus, right? He, he multiplies yeah. it. But here we get that Jesus took the bread, the loaves, and then when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. You know, in our, we remind ourselves of our Lord on a night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples. Uh, so we see here another illusion, a reminder, a, you know, in our text of our Lord giving of himself. Um, and for us, our ears start perking up. And mine do when I read that verse, as I think about, you know, the times here that we, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, here's Jesus giving his life, uh, his flesh for the life of the world. Um, you know, unless you eat, your, eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you, right? We would be amiss not to connect and notice um, here a very striking similarity in the words. Um, with that. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in real quick there, Pastor Belt, because this was, this was one place where as I was reading it, I did notice particularly in the, the giving thanks of Jesus, the echo in the words of institution for the Lord's Supper. At the same time, I, I also noticed that it, it seems like there's a few less echoes in John's gospel than there are in the synoptic gospels. Now I didn't, I didn't go back to Matthew, Mark, and Luke and read it, but it seems to me that at least in one of them, or maybe all of them, they talk about Jesus actually breaking the mm. bread. There are a few more of those verbal cues that while certainly we picture Jesus doing that in John, John doesn't write it that way with that same language. Right. So that the the connections are maybe a little bit more muted in John. But then, you know, just listening to you right now, you know, John also doesn't actually record the institution of the Lord's Supper in the same way that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. So you you kind of, and then of course, you know, you kind of opened up that that whole, sometimes Lutherans will <laughs> talk about this, is John 6 about the Lord's Supper or not? And right. there can be, you know, various thoughts on that that I'm sure we'll talk about as we, we dig into this chapter more. But, I, you know, just thinking about the way John writes it here, and especially with that giving thanks, you know, I, I'm with you. I have a hard time not hearing an echo of what our Lord does in his in the his supper as well, even if ma and making those connections later in this chapter, even if it's a bit more muted, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I just I wanted to throw that out there. I think that's fair. Yeah. Okay. So so we've got the the giving thanks of Jesus. He's distributing the bread. And again, we're gonna we're gonna keep digging into some of these connections that we can make, I'm convinced, with the Lord's Supper later. Jesus, the fish is there also. Then in verse 12, we get to the matter of leftovers. This is brought up in the Synoptic Gospels as well. Talk about the significance of the leftovers that we see. Yeah. So you get, you know, they had their fill and he tells his disciples, right? He commissions them. He sends them, right? Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. And, and that word that nothing may be lost, Jesus will use that. And especially in his prayer to his father at the end of the gospel, when he's talking about, right, all that you have given to me, I have lost not one, except, you know, the, the son of destruction there. Um, so the scriptures could be fulfilled. But, you know, John will use that word. Jesus uses that word as, once again, the harvest field, right? He's collecting, he's gathering, and he's going to use his followers, his disciples, to do this task. Uh, gathering, you know, the leftover, which also suggests that there's going to be more to give out, right? I'm sure that bread's not going to go to waste. Uh, so the disciples are going to be the ones through whom Jesus provides yet for more. And, you know, going once again, if we want to flash ahead in our minds to John chapter 10 with the good shepherd, right? That there's other people of Jesus's flock, not part of this one in this pen, that he's going to come and gather and collect. And so we see another kind of hint in the text of, you know, there's more to give out. Uh, there's more to supply. There's more for Jesus to give, right? This isn't the end. Um, of this feast. So, mm. yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, or, you know, you made the connection to Psalm 23 earlier and thinking through that Psalm again, I know it's, it's a cup that runs over there in Psalm 23, but that abundance that's there in Psalm 23 is certainly present here in, in John six as well with these leftovers that are gathered by the disciples. Now 
after that, John gives us the interpretation that the people give. And you brought this up earlier. They look at this and they say about Jesus that he is the prophet who is to come into the world. Remind us of what this, what they're talking about. What does that mean that they identify him as the prophet? Yeah. So, you know, the prophet, it, it brings to mind the book of Deuteronomy, you know, chapter, I do believe 18, where, yeah. you know, Moses is talking about that there will come a prophet like him from among your brothers and to him you must listen to. Uh, and so this idea that there is one who is to come who will be, you know, perhaps greater than Moses, like Moses. Uh, and at the end of Deuteronomy, right, we have that that's not really ominous, but kind of that hopeful look forward that, well, since Moses, there has been no one like him in all of Israel. Uh, you know, kind of as the anticipatory of there is one yet to come. And the crowds, they see this sign and this miracle, and they are sure, certainly thinking of the wilderness wanderings, of the feeding of the, the masses. And they're thinking, this is the guy. This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. They're pretty certain of that. Uh, so right here, you know, if we just pause at this text, it sounds wonderful. You know, there's more yet to say and do in this chapter um, that will come out because they, they probably speak, we would say, better than they know. And everyone is doing that in John's gospel. You know, Caiaphas will do it later on when it's better that one man should die for the nation than all of them should die. Um, and he's speaking on behalf because he's high priest, so he's speaking prophetically. Uh, and so he speaks better than he knows. We're going to have Pilate, you know, everyone during the crucifixion, they're speaking better than they know. It maybe is one of those instances here in our text that the people, they're, they're right, but they don't know how right they are. Yeah. Right. And they don't know, I think they also don't know in what way they are right. Yeah. So they, they have correctly identified the prophet here. John the Baptist rightly denied that he was the prophet back in chapter one. They're right that Jesus is the prophet, but they're not, they don't quite know what that means yet, or they don't have the right conception of what it means for Jesus to be this prophet. They also apparently are ready to make him king. John tells us that in verse 15. And Jesus doesn't want that. Talk about this desire to make them Jesus king and why Jesus withdraws because of it. Yeah. You know, the crowd, and we see this all the time with Jesus, you know, and in the other gospels, how he talks about, don't tell anyone this, you know, he strictly charges them not to tell anyone that he's the Christ, not yet at least. And here, right, this is a, another indication of text. This is not how Jesus wants it to be done. His way is not how people think of glory. It's not how they think of, you know, power or kingship, you know, the way that Jesus sees his glory, we, we heard it earlier, right? When the Son of Man is lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up. Um, that Jesus' glory comes on the cross. Uh, it's in the, the, the revelation of God. That's how the glory of God is given, how it's tied to the salvation of his people. And, and that's how God's glory is revealed. So Jesus, he, he looks at this and, and he's like, not now not in this way, not yet. Um, it, it will come, it will happen. And, you know, chapter seven, we kind of have this again, where if you, if you, if you want to do anything, you should do it publicly. And then Jesus doesn't go, but then he goes to the feast later on, right? He's going to go on his time. Uh, it's not going to be on anyone else's schedule, not on, on their plan. This is on God, the father's plan that his son, Jesus has come into the world to do. Uh, and so I think that timing is important here. Hmm. So Jesus withdraws because it is not time for him to be a king, and he's not going to be a king in the way that they perceive him to be one. He withdraws. That provides the opportunity for what happens in the rest of our text. We're picking up again with the text in John 6, verse 16. When evening came, Jesus' disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. That's the rest of our text for today. That was through John 6, verse 21. So it's it's evening now in verse 16. We're going to find out it's dark. You mentioned the themes of light and darkness earlier. Talk about the the setting for what happens next. Just make sure we understand, you know, how to picture this in our minds. Yeah. So you can picture all, you know, Jesus is teaching, they've been eating, and now that the sun's starting to get low on the horizon, 
And, and Jesus has withdrawn. You know, John doesn't really connect what the Synoptic Gospels do with Jesus dismissing and telling his disciples to get into the boat. So as we kind of let John speak here, right, it's kind of like Jesus has vanished. He's, he's gone away. And the disciples, you know, we may in chapter 21, after Jesus has vanished, right, they, they look at one another and like, well, I'm going to go fishing and, well, I'll join you. And so we might get a little bit of that again here where the disciples, you know, Jesus, maybe in the midst of the crowd, they've kind of lost him. Who knows? And they decide, well, let's go down into the, the sea and get into the boat and, and let's go. And it's right as they get into the sea and start off that we're told that it is dark. It, it's nighttime. Uh, and in the ancient world, you know, in our world, it's still pretty light out because we have all these street lights. We, our houses, our blocks are lit up. Uh, but in the ancient world, when it's dark, it's dark. And so that kind of sets the stage for that. And in John's gospel, the theme of light and darkness, you know, with Jesus being gone and not in the picture, right? The day, we can still work while it's day. No one can work when it's night. Uh, and here we have the disciples, they're trying to work while it's night, rowing in the boat. They're having a rough time of it with the, the rough seas and the wind that's blowing. Um, and so it's kind of picturing an, an ominous, ominous scenario. Um, you know, it, it suggests maybe a spiritual condition too. Um, but there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, in the text, we're kind of almost dis- with the disciples, almost distraught um, as they find themselves making painful headway. Mm, right. So this is a difficult situation to say the least for Jesus' disciples. They're not sure where he is. Then they see him walking on the sea and coming near the boat. They're frightened. And here is the word of Jesus. We have not encountered too many words of Jesus in this text, but the ones that are there are significant, and perhaps none more so than these. It is I, do not be afraid. Mm. Talk about the way that Jesus coming and his words to his disciples bring this comfort and even joy, as it says in verse 21. You know, they're at first frightened, right? What they see frightens them. It's not until they hear the words of Jesus that they're able to be at joy, at peace, and at rest, and you know, overjoyed. Where you know, we, as we hear that they take him gladly into the boat. Uh, but you know, Jesus is walking. You can think they're having a hard time. Uh, the sea is rough. The wind is going. It's dark out, and they see him. And this, you know, the darkness has not overcome him. You know, John says in the very first chapter of his gospel. And here we see the, the waves, the darkness, the you know, the winds, they have not overcome Jesus. And, but, you know, this at first is terrifying until Jesus has to speak that word, right? He is the word of God. And so as he speaks, it is I, right? It, it's not one of Jesus' I am statements. Um, but it, it certainly, you, you can get a, a picture in the text as Jesus walks on water. The Psalms talk about you know, Yahweh, the Lord, who w- rides the sea, who walks on the seas, um, controls his creation. And we, we certainly can get this impression here, we should, of uh, it, it is I. Well, who is this? This is the Lord. Uh, this is God in flesh. Um, and do not be afraid. And, it, you know, as we read the rest of this, we're going to catch this again at the end of the gospel with these same words when Jesus shows up on the day of resurrection. Right? Just when you think that the darkness has overcome him, right? Death has won. Jesus shows up in the room. He suddenly appears. And he tells them, you know, it's I. Uh, don't be afraid. He shows them his hands and his side. So we have echoes here also of the end of the gospel at the resurrection as well. Um, and then we're told in that same verse there, right? As you, as you get to that final verse, right? We're told that they are glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was on the land to which they were going. And, you know, this is kind of an interesting image as well. Hmm. So talk more about that image of Jesus being in the boat. You know, we often refer to the what sometimes we call it the sanctuary of our churches, but the place where the people sit, that'll sometimes be called the nave, which is mm-hmm. a, a that's got a nautical term, you know, nave, navy. Talk about this idea of Jesus being in the boat and how that still gets it's an image that occurs in the church still today. Yeah. Right. Um my congregation included, right? It looks like we're inside of a boat. Yeah. when we're there and the, the terms are supposed to pick up on that too. So it's no accident here that the disciples are in a boat when Jesus comes to them. When the going gets tough, they're not going anywhere. Uh, without Jesus, the work will never be done, um, even with our best effort. But as they take Jesus in the boat, you know, we're not told exactly how this, we're just told immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. 
And, you know, is this a miraculous? All of a sudden, they'd, Jesus gets in the boat and they're there, uh, I, I, even though they're in the middle of the lake. And here we, you know, we can remind ourselves that when Jesus shows up, we will be exactly where we need to be. When he's here, when we're having the divine service and our Lord is here with his gifts, right? Things are right because Jesus is here with us, um, with his church, with his people in the boat here as we have it in the text. Um, immediately they will be where they are going. You know? And exactly when Jesus comes again on the last day, and maybe we can almost picture Jesus when he comes again. You know, Jesus tells us to lift up our eyes because our salvation has drawn near. Uh, maybe uh, the first word out of his mouth as we see him will be, it's I, don't be afraid. Um, and what comfort we can take in that too, that our Lord's coming for us, even on that great and awesome day when he comes again as to judge the living and the dead. Uh, he comes to save his people. Uh, and we'll be immediately, no matter where we're at, we'll be immediately right where Jesus wants us to be because Jesus is there. Mm. You you connected the joy here with seeing Jesus and welcoming him into the boat with the joy of the disciples when they receive him or he just shows up in the, the locked room after the resurrection. Mm. Talk more about that joy that is ours to have Jesus in the boat or in the church with us. Yeah. You know, to know that our Savior is for us, right? This this is the very uh, kernel of the gospel. God for us, with us. Jesus dies for us, right? When I we give someone, I go by in the table tonight. I, I have services on Thursday evening as well, and you know tonight when I my parishioners are joined here and I look at them and I you know, take eat. This is the body of Jesus given for you, and you know as we receive our Lord too. Right? What joy is there that my sins are forgiven? My Lord is for me. He goes with me because that's his promise. And you know, just as here the disciples receive Jesus into the boat, we're told the, almost with the exact same wording at the end of the gospel, when they see Jesus, they are glad to see him. Um, Jesus' people are always happy. We, we never have to be downcast when we come before our Lord knowing that he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love as he confesses himself in Exodus. Um, and, and so here in the text, right, and, and for ourselves, there's joy when Jesus comes because when he comes, things happen. Mm. Yeah, what a, what a wonderful ending to our text today with the disciples being glad to have Jesus with them, being at land. Again, this will set the stage for the rest of the conversation that takes place in John chapter 6, as the crowd will find Jesus again, and he will begin to teach them what they should understand from these things. We're going to look at this more on Sharper Iron in coming episodes. Got about a minute here to wrap things up, Pastor Belt. Help us to, to see this text and the beauty that's ours from what Jesus does in the first part of John 6. Yeah, you know, sets the tone. Jesus provides for his people. He he sees us as the reason for why he has come. And and he comes to all, whether they are they going to receive him as the Samaritans do in chapter four or the crowds here, even though they reject him later on, he comes for all. Um, his death and resurrection, right, is for the life of the world, which he has come to give. Uh, that we participate in, that we receive is not just a future hope that we have coming on the last day. It's something that is ours now that we can receive Jesus with joy and gladness because he is our savior and he is our resurrected Lord. Pastor Andrew Belt is pastor at Christ Lutheran Church in Marshfield, Wisconsin, helping us today to study John chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. Pastor Belt, thanks for being our guest today. Thanks for having me on. Jesus gives to his people with great abundance. He fed the 5,000 with far more food than they needed. There were leftovers. So he still gives to us in great abundance today, not only for our physical needs, but our spiritual needs. He feeds us with his word and his own body and blood at his table. God be praised for this joy to have Christ with us in his church. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about the Gospel of John, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.